but we could get started and if that works for everyone else. Okay. Hi everyone, welcome to Accessibility. Let's talk about it. This is a roundtable discussion and it's um, being hosted by Christina Calhoun, who's the Instructional Design and Online Learning Librarian for Oklahoma State University Libraries. She's an experienced educator and instructional designer and holds a Master of Science in Educational Technology from Oklahoma State University. And also Dr. Kathy S. Miller, she's the sister, an assistant professor of professional practice the OER librarian and the library liaison to music and theater departments, also at Oklahoma State University. Um, we're going to have a chat going. So if you, you know, it's a round table, so we'll be talking. But if you have any questions like technical issues unique to you, please just put it in chat and I'll, I'll take a look and see what I can do for you. So whenever you are ready, Christina and Dr. S. Miller, please get going. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Lisa, for introducing us. Um, my co-host, Kathy, is across the ocean right now, um, coming to us live internationally. So I'm very grateful that she took time to uh, join us. Um, but yeah, thank you all for being here. We're just going to take some time today and talk about accessibility. Um, you know, our objectives today, our goal is to learn from and with one another. Almost everyone is going to agree that creating accessible learning experiences is absolutely important, absolutely necessary. Um, but the knowledge and skills needed to create and ensure accessible learning is incredibly broad. <laughs> and it isn't really ever taught in degree programs or, you know, as part of on the job training. It's not something that you come in day one and they say, let's get you trained in this, you know, usually. Uh, you know, we're usually just expected to kind of know how to do accessibility. Um, and there's not really any checks and balances to make sure, you know, and that are associated with that. So today, our hope is that we can talk together, um, talk about how we prioritize and incorporate accessibility into our roles, our responsibilities, our processes. Um, and we're also going to use a shared Google Doc. I'm going to put a link to that in the chat in just a second. Um, and we'll use that to crowdsource some resources um, and ideas so you can save it, share it with others, whatever your heart desires. Um, and just to give you an idea, um, our, uh, what we're going to, what to expect during today's session. If we got the Zoom poll uh, up, we're going to do that. But if not, we'll just informally do a poll together. We had some technical difficulties with it, but we're going to roll with it. Um, and then we're, we'll briefly, you know, just a couple minutes, talk about and frame accessibility. So we're all on the same page with what we mean when we say that word. Um, and also what the practice of it can look like. Um, just kind of have some identifying markers for what it might look like for us um, in our jobs. Um, we're going to have some guided questions to discuss that accessibility practice as a group. And I encourage you all, both Kathy and I love questions. We, if you are here today and you don't know anything about accessibility, awesome. We're so glad you're here. If you're here and you know everything about it, we are so glad you're here. Everyone's voice is super important. And so we encourage conversation, question asking, you know, whatever is in your brain about it. Let's, let's bring it to the table today. Um, and like I mentioned that Google Doc, um, let me go ahead, oops, sorry, and I will uh, share this with you real quick. Um, of course, now, I don't have that bitly in front of me, so hold on. <laughs> let me copy it right, real quick and put that in the chat. Okay. There we go. Um, Oh, thank you, Brad. I appreciate that. As I was putting it in, you got you beat me to it and put the accessible version of it, clickable version of it. All right. So, um, so a poll, real quick, and I don't think we have it uh, available, but let's just, you know, if you could put it in the chat, um, you know, how equipped do you feel to create accessible learning experience? If you feel comfortable putting it in the chat, if you don't, totally okay um, to not do that, or if you want to, you know, uh, raise your hand and, you know say it, that's fine too. Um, I will share with you that I am uh, sort of comfortable and I've been doing this for years. Um, and I'll tell you why that is in a bit. All right, Christina, do you want me to read out what everybody's sharing in the chat? Yeah, that would be great. Thank you, Kathy. It looks like uh, we have several sort of comfortables. One is between comfortable and sort of comfortable. Uh, another sort of comfortable. And we have one that is C, which I think is looking for places to learn about it. Mm -hmm. Yep, want to learn some more. Excellent, excellent. 
Awesome. Well, thank you all for sharing. We really appreciate that. Yeah, you know, certain areas I'm A and others B. Yet, Thomas, I think that is kind of my reason for saying B as well, is that I, I know what I know, but I also know what I don't know, but I can go learn it somewhere because I don't know everything. <laughs> um, Right. And this is, Kathy, I'd say the closer I get really to the top side of B, the more I'm worried that I'm actually at D and I just <laughs> don't know it. Yeah. And I think that's the beauty of, you know, accessibility knowledge is that at some days we could all be different levels of it. Um, even people who do this for a living, there's so much knowledge out there uh, that it's, you know, it's rare to find somebody who says, yep, I know every single thing to do, how to do it right. And, you know, yep, I'm good, <laughs> you know? Uh, and I think that's the beauty of it is saying, I don't know it all, but I, I can know how to go figure it out and make sure that it's accessible. Um, awesome. Well, thank you all for sharing. We appreciate that. Um, really quickly, we're just going to define um, what accessibility in learning means. And we're going to use this definition from, from uh, the Office for Civil Rights. And the way they define it um, is, <clears throat> excuse me, a person with a disability should have the opportunity to acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions, and enjoy the same services as a person with a, without a disability. And they should be able to do this in an equally effective manner, an equally integrated manner, and with substantially equivalent ease of use. Um, so basically, we should provide experiences for students so that they can get the same content, the same interactions, same programming, same everything from us um, in either an equal way or an equivalent way. Um, and in, in doing so, we're providing that for them, um, you know, in, in the same fashion as someone without a disability, same or, or equivalent. Um, I've also added this definition to that Google Doc. So in case you want to go back and reference it and say, what is it again? You know, there it is. <laughs> um, there we go. Okay, so Real quickly, we'll also just want to frame our discussion by talking about some um, common accessibility practices that we might see. And uh, the most common one, and one we've all either probably had experience with or are currently experiencing, um, or some level of experience with it, is that accessibility as an add-on. And this is where accessibility is added in at the end of a project or after it's been completed completely. Um, and then, or maybe it's somebody has brought to our attention something that's inaccessible, and so we remediate. Um, and in this model, there's usually a couple of people who are responsible for making things accessible. Um, that's their role. And the model is usually quite comp compliance focused and, you know, checking those boxes to make sure that legal bases are covered. Um, and accessibility, since it's ex historically been seen as something outside as an additional step, it was the law was added um, in 1973 and has grown since then. Um, but it's not, it wasn't built in as originally as part of normal processes. So sadly, this type of practice can lead to othering those with disabilities because accessibility is seen as something extra that we have to do to accommodate those with disabilities instead of just something that's part of our foundation to our workflow. Um, and that's part of the norm. Um, unfortunately, it can be, this system can be highly inefficient also and unsustainable since we end up doing things twice, <laughs> doing twice the work later to remediate and to fix things that are inaccessible. Um, then if we had built it in, you know, accessibly upfront. Contrasted with that is the practice of adding in accessibility from the foundation. Um, and that focuses on making accessibility a core part of everything you do. Um, it's something that it is everyone's job and it's just built into everyone's role, everyone's responsibility, their processes. Um, so when you prioritize accessibility and make it part of everyone's day-to-day -day routines, it just becomes the norm. And that turns the focus to equity and providing those equitable experiences for students. Um, equal and equivalent access to everyone instead of just checking a compliance box. Um, and although incorporating accessibility does take additional time, and as I'm sure we're going to talk about lots of training and knowledge and skills, um, it does save so much more time in the end by minimizing that rework. Um, and also you're spreading the responsibility around. It's not just one or two people fixing everything after the fact. Um, so those are just two common models that we see a lot. Um, and we'll hopefully get to talk about a little bit what each of us experience and how that looks. 
Um, and Simon says, you know, one thing I've learned is that accessibility benefits everyone. Yep, lots of my students use accessibility features, not just students with disability. That is absolutely right. I'm so glad you brought that point up, Simon, um, because it's not just uh, people with disabilities who will benefit from this. Um, if you think about things like alt text, um, I was talking about this with my husband yesterday. It's great for people who use screen readers because they can know what's in an image, but it's also great for people who don't have great internet connection because they might not be able to load the images and so they can see the description and know what's in it. Um, so yeah, that's a great point, thank you. All right, so let's just talk about it. And you know, if, if you're not feeling particularly chatty, that's totally fine. You can add your comment to the chat. We're gonna be monitoring that as well. Um, but again, let's uh, remind everyone, let me pull that uh, Google Doc up um, and we'll, we'll put it in the chat again. If someone could drop that again, um, oops, there it is. Um, sorry about that. Um, there we go, okay. Um, and these questions are in there. And as we're talking, if you find something um, that, uh, you know, you want to keep and remember or something you want to share with others, please feel free to add it to that crowdsource document. Um, I have some that I'll be some resources I'll be adding along the way as well. Um, but even if it's just a, a tip or trick, you know, feel please feel free to add that. Um, but this first question is and, and we encourage you if you do want to speak to unmute yourself. Um, feel free to share um, or type in the chat, like we said. Um, so question one, what does your accessibility practice look like? And, and we can, Kathy and I can go first and just share that uh, we very much so for a very long time, we're in that first model. Um, and as the instructional design librarian, I did a lot of rework, uh, getting things at the end of a project, having to remediate them. And um, one day I remediated a, um, uh, it was a PowerPoint poster presentation that I had to basically redo from start to finish because there was an accessibility built into it. And I said, okay, no, we can't do this anymore. <laughs> Something's got to change. Um, and so for us, we started uh, slowly and over time with just our unit, um, the Research and Learning Services unit at the library, um, where every week uh, I do an accessibility tip. And so over time and in small chunks, um, our team is learning uh, different accessibility practices. Um, and it's, you know, not, if you're trying to learn it all at once, it's very overwhelming. Um, but we tried to flip that script and I'll put in the chat, this is what our uh, guide is for it, where I put, you know, all of our knowledge is cataloged there. So every time we learn something, people can go back and reference it. Um, and so we're just starting, we just started with that, with just our team. Um, and then after that, I started adding a weekly, into our weekly newsletter, taking these tips and putting them in there so the whole library could encounter them. Um, I still now also encourage that before anyone starts a project that they come talk to me and consult with me about accessibility so we can talk through you know, what goes into that first. Um, and so we've tried to find ways to uh, you know, flip it a little bit so that it's part of everyone's practice. Um, I see Stephanie in the chat said, look for buttons that read, click here to join or just spending time on whatever website and clicking on links and reading exploring until I find what I'm looking for. Oh, yep, that's great. That is one thing I do is, you know, uh, look for resources out there. I think this, if that's what you're referring to is just looking for resources to learn what you need to learn. So I'll, I'll open up the floor now if anyone wants to share, what is your accessibility practice look like? Well, this is Kathy, and I apologize for the background noise, but mine uh, base really is very much informed by how Christina has invited us to interact with these concepts, and it's uh, giving us permission to learn one or two small things at a time instead of trying to build out an entire uh, piece that's accessible, which, of course, is the end goal to give your, you know, I give myself permission to do a little bit more each time and remember what she's talked about in the latest accessibility tip. I make use of the templates she's given us, made for us that are accessible. Um, sometimes really though, what my accessibility practice looks like, realizing, realizing I've shared a PDF in a meeting with other people that Christine is in that isn't accessible and the look of terror that crosses my face because I know she'll be disappointed in me. But um, most of the time it's just optimistic and an air of appreciative inquiry and confidence that I can find one thing to do, even if it's just tossing in some alt text, text for an image or 
uh, rewording a sentence that includes a link uh, to meet standard accessibility practices. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, I, I love the conversations I have with Kathy about accessibility. They're some of my favorites. <laughs> Simon says she he learns from me things that he didn't know. Uh, color contrast, using alt text and PowerPoint images, et cetera. Oh, I appreciate that, Simon. Thank you. He, Simon is also part of our team in, in our research and learning services department. I can offer that from the state regents, you know, we as a state agency have really strict requirements about the information that we put out to the public regarding accessibility. And I think about five years ago, our agency participated along with some institutions in the Able Tech project where we did an accessibility evaluation of policy and procedure. And it was interesting because the result after that is that they develop divisional teams that kind of collaborate within our organization on accessibility. So like within academic affairs, we have somebody who's actually Kyle Foster that I work with who will do trainings for us at least once a year on like mostly the things that we use every day. And I think that's also really important, you know, considering an accessibility practice is you have to make it relevant to what people need. Um, you know, if you have somebody that deals with documents all day, they will want to spend time learning about word accessibility. Whereas if you have somebody whose main responsibility is updating a website, I think that, you know, there are ways that you can help those people. But I will say the most impactful thing, you know, I think concerning the practice is learning that every tool that we interact with on a daily basis, and I'm looking at mostly the Microsoft products, have these easy ways to make things accessible in ways where you don't have to be a knowledge expert about it to be able to see what is wrong and what you need to do to be able to fix it before you actually send something out. So yeah, it, it helps to have a team, I think, you know, and support. But again, I think these tools that we have are also getting smarter on a regular basis to be able to help us kind of figure it out uh, for lay people, you know, lay persons that may not have that technical expertise. <laughs> I love the way you phrase that, Brad. This is Kathy that you said, we don't need to be knowledge experts. We, we just maybe need to be a little curious. That, that's, that's a nice accessible, <laughs> accessible approach to this, to accessibility. Yeah. I also like, oh, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> I, I also like um, using the resources that, that we have at our institutions because like, um, at OCCC, they have sandboxes that they give us for our LMS, and we can just get in there and um, work with all the different tools together. And even though, like Ally, I'm sure is what um, uh, you're talking about when you're talking about going through and checking everything afterwards, even though that's not a great thing to rely on for sole accessibility purposes, it is really great after you've played around and given yourself the room to make mistakes and learn a great way to check and verify. And when you know things say, okay, I know what's being flagged as an error isn't really an error because there is, you know, alt text there and there, that isn't an image that it's flagging as an image and those types of things. So you can kind of evaluate your progress and use it. Um, so it's really nice to, you know, not be kind of a hypocrite and do what you tell your students to do, give themselves the room to make mistakes and learn from it because it's how we learn and develop and improve. So I think it's great. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. I love that. That's absolutely true. And it's I love how you incorporate that, like kind of taking those chunks that you're learning and using it as your checks as you go along and saying like, okay, I've learned this, let me use it, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm curious um, if anyone here that wants to speak up and if, if not, totally fine. Um, but if anyone here um, is a team lead or, you know, is uh, has set precedent for people um, in a group to say, like, here's what we're going to do or whatnot. Um, you know, Brad, I know you mentioned that at the Regents, like how you have the people come in and whatnot, but I'm just curious if there's uh, any precedents that have been set beyond just an individual practice. Yeah, Thomas, please. I'm a coordinator for our comp program. So I work with our master courses and when I first took over, I was told they were all accessible and they were not. Um, they were not at all because they, they probably were when they were created in like Word. Um, but I think the individual that was in charge of um, developing them didn't realize when you convert things over to PDF or when you 
transfer them into the LMS. There are things that can occur when you transfer documents over and, and do that, that that can mess all of that up and, and you have to do it a very specific way. And, and that's where, again, I think that things like Ally can come in and help and do that. And, um, you know, we were mandated really quickly that, you know, oh, we were supposed to have this done 10 years ago. And now we have to have it done tomorrow. Um, so I think that's another thing to take into account is, you know, to have patience with individuals and say, you know, this is something that we had tacked on on top of everything else we have to do, but it's something that benefits our students. So, you know, we can develop plans and, and if you need help and resources, I'm here for you. And it's not like an attack or criticism. It's something that's support for both you and for our students. So. Yeah, I love that. I love that recognizing that it's not just about equity for students, but also thinking about the people who have to put it in place. And this takes time and energy and expertise and things that you might not already have. And so saying, just do it, you know, is very different from saying, let me equip you for it. Uh, And so, yeah, I think that's a great point. Thank you. I also do want to throw out just for the sake of mentioning that we had some conversations in the Cole accessibility meeting this week. I think it was there about course templates, Um, you know, and this notion of academic freedom, and I I dare say versus accessibility, even though that's not what the dynamic is between those two things. But there is that certain amount of ownership, I think, at the base level of saying this is a federal requirement for our institutions that accept federal financial aid. We have to do this no matter what. And nobody wants to be responsible for getting a dear colleague letter on your campus and then having to go through uh, that remediation process, you know, with OCR that would be a disaster, you know, and potentially tank you financially. So there's there's so many different dynamics from the human component to the legal and logistical component of this of why you have to have an accessibility practice, I guess. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, thank you for that reminder, Brad. That's so true. There are uh, many, uh, many, there's several, a handful of laws that, you know, we definitely have to abide by and they will be, you know, we will be held accountable if they're not. And so, Aside from the fact that it's an equity practice, but we want to make sure every student has an equal and ex- equivalent uh, learning experience, that we need to do it. <laughs> we are required to do it. <laughs> um, if we don't do it, they will make sure we do it. <laughs> um, Brett in the chat said, we include ally scores and expectations as part of our, our quality process at UCO. Oh, that's neat. Okay, so it's part of like a checklist you have. Excellent. Um, Stephanie said, uh, Oh, that's okay, Stephanie. Do what you need to do. Um, we we are glad we had you for a time. See you later. <laughs> um, all right, so let's jump to the next question. Um, how did you get started with accessibility and what recommendations do you have for others who are getting started? Um, and I can just jump in first and say that I, I mentioned earlier you know, the, the turning point for me to bring accessibility to our team was when I had to remediate that whole big PDF and it took days and it was horrifying, and, um, you know, just, just from my perspective, not horrifying in real life, but um, uh, that's what was the turning point for me bringing it to our team. But uh, getting started with accessibility is just something that um, as an instructional designer, you're just always expected to know accessibility. Um, and so in the beginning of my career, I thought that meant make sure you have closed captions, make sure colors aren't bad, and make sure you use alt text. And that's like basically all I thought it was. And I was like, okay, if I'm doing those things, I, I'm making it accessible. Um, and I've been at OSU now for seven years, maybe almost seven years. Um, and my first year there, um, I got involved with Able Tech. Um, and they had, you know, their conference, uh, Oklahoma Able Tech, and they had a yearly conference and all these sessions that I started going to them and realizing, oh my goodness, I don't know anything. <laughs> There's so much more out there. And I've been giving students experiences that are not equal or equivalent. Um, and so I just, over time, started attending. Uh, you know, I, I found listservs. Uh, anytime there was an accessibility webinar available on a listserv, I attended it. Um, whenever Able Tech had an event, I attended it started joining other listservs, um, such as, what's the one on, uh, uh, I'll think of them in a second, I'll put them in the, on the document, um, but just started joining places. So over time, this is, my knowledge has been building, you know, monthly, yearly, um, over time. It's not something that one day I said, I'm going to sit down and learn this, and now I know everything accessibility-wise. 
Um, no, it's, it's a, something you incorporate into your practice. Um, and so every time I start a new project, let's say I'm using you know, Adobe InDesign for this project, I Google accessibility in, in, in InDesign, find resources for it, make sure I'm doing that accessibly. Um, and so really I focus on the project level and say, what, what, is, what do I need to build in here accessibly? Um, and you know, keep checklists and things like that for myself. So once I've learned it, I don't forget and say, okay, that's in the back of my brain now. Um, so that's my own personal journey. And I'm gonna add some of my, the websites in there um, that I've used, but please share with me, how else have you guys gotten started with it? I like to think about um, things like the, uh, the automotive industry for years, um, they cars didn't have seat belts and then they started to require seat belts. And then, so now like we have this whole suite of safety features, seat belts and airbags and crumple zones and all that. And there was a lot of pushback on some of these because it was, they were like having to design around these features. And now all cars are just expected to have these like backup cameras and all the, and it's safety, it's good for everybody. Um, and if you make a car today, it has to have all these things. And for accessibility, that's sort of like my mindset. Um, I'm for, for the question of how do I get started and what recommendation, don't think of these things like, if you're looking at color palettes, think of them as like, what's a color palette that is an accessible color palette? Don't look for a color palette that is like all light pastels that you think would be great. And then three months into the project realize, oh wait, that's not accessible. Think of it like a seatbelt, like it has to be an accessible color palette and then work around that and uh, look for fonts that are accessible and readable and then craft it around these things. Don't, don't try and like stick them on later. Yeah, I love that, Simon. That's that foundational component of before you get deep into it, the very first decisions should include those accessibility factors. And I hope you're all okay with that teacher silence while I wait for people to talk, so. <laughs> I'll speak up here. So I really first encountered accessibility being an academic advisor and also teacher, you know, working with students with disabilities, but never recognized really what went into web accessibility until I became an instructional designer and working in that area of e-learning and seeing, it was really seeing the experiences of students, particularly, I remember going to a PD event one time and seeing a video of a student that was navigating a class with a screen reader. And I think that it was that aha moment there of seeing somebody and what that experience looks like and how different it is from my own experience. Uh, it looks much more complex than my experience of navigating information. And it, it was just that kind of epiphany there of saying to yourself, I need to do everything that I can to make this as easy as possible for individuals that are in this circumstance. And why wouldn't you, <laughs> you know, isn't that why we're here? I mean, particularly within education, but in other contexts too, you know, we all want to serve every person equally and make sure they have the same opportunity. Um, so that's, that's kind of pushed my interest in learning more and becoming more proficient and being able to teach others about it and you know share that why, that why message. I love that so much, Brad, that uh, focus on the user and who they are, they're human beings. And these are real experiences. Um, and I, I would echo that in my own um, journey that reading those experiences, there's, and I'll, I'll put some resources in there as well as hearing stories from users, um, but, just seeing it in action and hearing those firsthand perspectives changed everything as well. Yeah. Um, Brett said, I got started as an ID. My recommendations are to explore, fail, try again, and be comfortable with the unknown. Sometimes you have to do your best while learning and gathering resources. Oh, yes, Brett. <laughs> uh, and that we all think of failure as like, oh, this is horrible, but no, it, it's a good thing here. And, you know, uh, I think as Brad mentioned earlier, like the, you know, Microsoft accessibility checkers that you have and things like that. Um, and Thomas mentioned his institutional resources and like, yeah, use those things, use those as checks and balances and say, oh, nope, didn't get it. Let me, let me try again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> yep, there's only one way to eat an elephant, one bite at a time. Yep, absolutely. If you try to eat the elephant of accessibility at once, you will fail <laughs> miserably. Anyone else want to share? Oh, Simon said it also helps to work in an environment where failure is not punished and everyone's on the same team. Oh, yes. Um, Simon and I, as I mentioned, are on the same team. So I can echo what he's saying that it, that is absolutely true. We have uh, an incredibly supportive boss who is in this meeting because she is so supportive and wonderful. Um, uh, but yeah, and uh, even, you know, so our, our boss is super supportive. There she is in the chat. Um, for the initiatives uh, and as well as our associate dean all the way up to our dean of our library, um, which makes just a world of difference um, because as, as I think as Brad mentioned earlier, or uh, Thomas, I'm sorry, you say about like how people have to do this, you know, you need support to do it. You can't just say one day, oh, I'm going to put aside all of my other projects and learn how to do accessibility. It takes time and effort and money even um, at times. And so, um, yeah, that uh, support is unmatched. <laughs> that's why if an organization can make accessibility a priority from the top, that's your best bet for getting it implemented, I think, is because it's not just, and provide the resources for it, because now it's not just on the one person to do it. As much as we all want to do it, it's, you know, we're real people too. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, thank you all. Let's move to the next question here. How do you discover your accessibility knowledge and skills gaps? And how do you go about learning more? Um, as I mentioned in my journey, I didn't know what I didn't know. And then one day I knew what I didn't know and thought, oh, no, I'm in trouble. Um, so uh, now I realize I'm not in trouble. You know, there's a learning process to go about it. But I'm curious um, to know how you all um, and it, it, maybe you don't know at this moment, and that's okay to say that too. This is Brett King here. Uh, I'd say that I think, um, you know, being an instructional designer and being in education, I think it's always understanding that you have room to grow. You are always learning and growing. Um, have that lifelong learner mindset and then just open yourself up to attending, you know, webinars such as this and others that are offered in the state and everywhere else. And by doing so, you you begin to understand your gaps and you understand that accessibility is a not a finite thing. It's a growing thing and um, continues to change and evolve and standards grow and adapt. So I think it's just sort of understanding that it's it's fluid and it's not just a, you know, uh, singular thing. Yeah, that's a really good point. Because um, we think about, you know, online learning, what it is today will literally be different tomorrow. <laughs> it's changing every day. And so I like that thinking about it like it's fluid. I think that's a really great point. Yep, that lifelong learning mindset, Simon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so exactly. Simon typed it before I read it out. <laughs> you had the same thoughts. <laughs> also, like, I don't know, like, I always try to provide um, continuous opportunities for anonymous um, student feedback um, so that students can feel safe, like letting me know if they're having issues. So that's just another layer of people that are actually using the things on the other side, because we get whatever role you have, like the instructor versions, like teacher brain. I've been doing this for 20 years. I don't have the insight they have into seeing it the way they see it. And I constantly, even though it's not their responsibility to, to take on that role and to do it, um, benefit from their insight and, and want them to know that they're a part of this process and a valuable part of it. Um, and also utilizing, you know, things like Ally. Um, but I always cover when I'm talking to other faculty members or people that are, uh, you know, colleagues, um, the illusion of fluency, like being able to address, like using the example of a penny, you know, everybody thinks they know a penny, but can you draw a penny from memory and, and do it? You know, it's an illusion. You think you know it, but you, you can't. And so um, reminding myself of that, and do I really understand and know this 
fully or is it just something I think I know? Um, um, and constantly striving to be better, I think is beneficial. Yeah, that's a really great point. Thank you, Thomas. Mm -hmm. What you think you know versus what you actually know. <laughs> um, Holly said in the chat, she usually comes to me with questions and I point her in the right direction, which I think is a, a, a great point that she brought up there is know who you can ask those questions to. Um, know your resources. Um, I did put some in the crowdsource resources that I know that when I don't know something accessible, I can email AbleTech and they'll say, here's the answer or here's the direction you can go in. Um, I've also, you know, saved a bunch of resources that I can go to, which I've, I've put in there. You know, the um, OCO has, a, you know, some digital accessibility resources, uh, AbleTech, Webbing. There's places I know that I can go to. Um, and it's important to find those. If we have anyone outside Oklahoma that's here, you know, go to your state representative or your, your people in your state that do that. Um, or, you know, trusted sources for that at your institution. Um, Holly also says, I also think it's sort of like when you start seeing your car everywhere after you've bought one, even though you never noticed before. Once I started to see the needs in one or two areas, it became more aware of them everywhere. I don't always know the solution, but I can identify the problems more readily. Yep, absolutely. You can't unsee it once you've seen it. Awesome. Thank you all for sharing. We're going to jump to the next question here, which is what accessibility do's and don'ts have you learned along the way? And maybe share some of your biggest challenges with that. We've got some good ones. I've been adding, as people have been talking, I've been adding them to the uh, tips and recommendations here. So thank you all for sharing, um, you know, and here's some resources here as well. while people think of them or type, oh, there we go, Brent. Don't use red and green together when contrast is necessary for interpretation. Ooh, that's a good one. Yes, uh, people may have red, green colorblindness and you will not be, they will not be able to see what you're writing. <laughs> so that's a good point is don't rely on color alone for what you're trying to, uh, uh, what content you're trying to convey because people might not be able to see it. Oh, Brett King, yeah, scan documents. Yep, those uh, are not accessible. It's basically a giant picture. <laughs> Don't 100% rely on auto-generated captions or alt text. Yep, that's a great point, Simon. Uh, you never know what you're gonna get with them and you might be surprised in the moment of what actually came out of the auto-generated and say, oops, that was not good. <laughs> I have sort of a, a bigger picture one that I, it's a kind of a shift in my mindset um, for a challenge, which is, if I don't have time to do it accessibly, then I don't have time to do it at all. Like instead of my mindset used to be like, I, I, I can just do a quick and dirty one and it's fine. You know, it'll get the job done and kind of shifting that mindset to know if I can't do it so that everybody can access it, then I don't have time to do that project. And I need to either find the time or say no to that project until I can do it the right way. Thank you. I think that's a really important perspective that you just shared, which is a lot of times we say like, well, let's just do it. You know, we'll just get it out there and then maybe we'll, we'll think about the accessibility. And um, yeah, I think that's a really important point is, well, but if it's, if you're not going to create that experience that everyone is going to be, have access to, why are you creating it? Um, so yeah, that foundational to it. Brad said, use heading structures whenever you can. Oh yes, Brad, that is a very important one. Um, that's actually what we're covering in our weekly accessibility tips right now is uh, styles and headings. <laughs> um, what else? Um, I will, uh, what was mine? I forgot it just now. Hold on, let me think. Oh, I feel like there's so many I've learned along the way, um, but a big one is just that you know, incorporating accessibility from the start. Um, if you are doing a project and you're like, I'm not sure what's accessible, just Google the individual pieces of it. Like, okay, I'm gonna start with Microsoft Word, Google accessibility in Microsoft Word. If you're just typing text, awesome. You can figure that part out pretty quick. You know, if you're using an image like Google accessibility with images. Um, and so that's my biggest one is every time I get to a new project, you know, Googling, and going to my trusted resources for info about those things. 
Um, Brad also says, always begin a document with Word before converting to PDF. Oh my goodness, yes, yes, yes. That's That was my lesson with the uh, PowerPoint poster PDF was because it wasn't built accessibly in PowerPoint, <laughs> It was a nightmare to fix in PDF, which is why I had to rebuild it in PowerPoint. Um, so yeah, that's why it's so important to start from the beginning with accessibility, because once you get to the PDF, you're going to have to redo so much if it wasn't built accessibly to begin with. And then if you make any changes in the original, you have to redo every change you did in the PDF. <laughs> it is a nightmare. How people think and add comments on adding to the document here. Um, Brett says, related, always try to find the original resource. Oh, yep, yep, yep. If you can find the original, go from that instead of using the PDF. And also from a, uh, you know, perspective of copyright, it's good to know where the original is and who created it and do you have the right to use it and whatnot. You know, just as a side note, uh, um, my co-presenter, Kathy, is our OER librarian, so I'm sure she would absolutely back that up. <laughs> Um, I would also say, like, if you have a person, an instructional designer, an accessibility resource, check in with them before you start a project, um, you know, because they could probably provide guidance on, um, you know, things you might not be thinking of or resources. Um, and if they don't, it's an opportunity for them to also learn alongside you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's good to have a resource you can turn to. Um, but on behalf of all the instructional designers in the world, please don't rely on us solely to do your accessibility because we're tired. <laughs> Christina, I think that makes a big difference because, <clears throat> you know, I think of things like virtual reality activities where sometimes, you know, the dynamic there can be this can't be made accessible, so I can't use this in my course. And that's not that's not the message of accessibility. It's that that learning experience has to be provided in an equivalent way to that student so that the outcome can be reached by them, which I, again, I, I agree with you completely that instructional designers can be a huge asset in coming up with those creative alternative ways to assess and provide activities. Absolutely, yeah. And that's that equivalent piece, right? Like there's not, there will be instances where it is absolutely not possible to um, provide the exact same experience to someone with disabilities, but you can provide an equivalent that gets the same content, they get the same outcomes, um, you know, and that's that important piece that instructional designers, like you said, can help you come up with and say, hey, let's brainstorm something. Here's how we could do it. Mm -hmm. I would also say one of my biggest challenges um, has been that piece of convincing people, because um, you can convince people to, to do things accessibly, um, but everyone has their own, everyone's their own person, right? And so, um, it's a cost benefit analysis that each person weighs into what they're doing. And so I understand that, um, you know, if I'm asking someone to do something accessibly, but they don't have that time or space to do it, um, you know, you're going to face that challenge of convincing someone. Um, and I think one of the biggest helps has been those real user stories of this is real life. And here's how you're, if you're not going to do this, here's how it will look to this person that you're telling them they're not worth receiving the same content. And obviously nobody purposely says that in their minds, like I'm going to not give them the same experience, um, but that's what the student hears, um, you know? So yeah, I would say that those user stories are super important. Well, we just have five minutes left. And so the last one um, is just how do you document? How do you preserve what you've shared for others, for yourself, you know, checklists and whatnot? Um, once you've learned something, you don't want to forget it. Um, and so how do you guys keep that in your brains? So I shared before that uh, library guide that, um, I think I shared it, I've already forgotten. Um, <laughs> it's Friday, uh, but that we use every time, yeah, I did, every time we do a session on accessibility tip, I put it up there and we can all reference it again. My best way is just to find options to continue to use them and 
like if I make a PowerPoint for class, just like use these tips that Christine has been putting together and, and uh, that, that use helps keep them fresh in my mind. Awesome. Brad says checklists are great. I still use one from my previous role at UCO that has the most commonly used programs. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah, I have uh, several handouts that I've gotten from different sessions I've attended that I have on my bulletin board. And if I'm going to use Word, I flip to it and say, okay, let me look at my checklist. And yep. Mm -hmm. Actually using it, <laughs> like, I mean, no matter how many checklists or bookmarks or things that you do, like you know, piggybacking on what Simon said, like, um, and not feeling like you have to automatically and instantly update everything you've ever done. Like interleaving is my friend, like mm -hmm. gradually going through and using it um, and not feeling like immediately you have to update everything like right now, um, because that's a great way to burn out um, and get overwhelmed and do that kind of thing. So so gradual interleaving of new practice into what you already have established, um, your current pattern, um, I think is reasonable, doable, um, and the best way to establish a pattern that'll hold and stick. So. I love that interleaving. Um, are they building the metaverse with accessibility in mind? Oh, oh. It just seems like with everything we've been talking about with designing for accessibility in mind, like the more that we're talking this morning, the more I keep thinking like, well, what about all the VR stuff that is uh, um, being done and like specifically with like cartoon avatars and all these other things, um, I know, like, I, I don't, I don't know, like, how, what does accessibility look like in an entirely computer generated 3D world? I, I don't know. Yeah. And Robert uh, said they are not, it's basically a land rush right now to stake claim on digital land and assets. Mm. Ooh, thank you for sharing this article, Brad. Yeah. And I skimmed it briefly and I kind of gathered that they do sacrifice accessibility for the sake of trying to be the first out there with an innovative product. So I would anticipate that the experience will not be quite so smooth uh, for users with disabilities up front, um, which is sad. Simon says we should start selling NFTs. <laughs> Yeah, I was in an Able Tech, uh, Oklahoma Able Tech had their yearly conference this week uh, and um, Tech Access OK, which I highly recommend if, uh, get on their listserv. And so every year it's just the best conference. Um, but uh, one of the presenters said in one of their session, basically exactly what you all are saying is, uh, you know, it's, it's get it out there and then we'll fix it, you know, and obviously that doesn't help. Uh, people who, with disabilities because they're left out from it. And then that also means, unfortunately, their voices are not informing these products as they're being built. And so it's being built without their voice at all completely, um, which is how we kind of have that initial accessibility practice is that resource, uh, resources, jobs, spaces were built without the informing voice of those with disabilities. And so then it was added later, you know, so yeah. I think in that space you're left to your own devices. Yeah, it sounds a, uh, it's horrifying. Uh, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Any other last minute comments uh, before we wrap here? I've, I've added a bunch of resources to that document um, that I personally have re uh, made a list of over time. I just keep adding to it. Um, so please feel free to use that, to share it, you know, save it, whatever your heart desires. Um, and, uh, yeah, any other final comments? Yeah, thank you guys so much. I've appreciated hearing your voices and your experiences and uh, that I think we are better together uh, when we come together and especially things like this where we're usually left to our own devices, <laughs> you know, not as much as technology, but uh, or the, uh, you know, the metaverse technology and whatnot. But, uh, yeah, so thank you all so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, very Christina. Much. Yeah. Um, Christine, since you're the host, you'll have to stop in this session for everyone. <laughs>